Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Thank you all for coming along to talk about what I think is a very important topic. Not the elephant in your chest, that's what we're hoping to avoid, but cardiac risk and how you avoid that. Well, I thought I'd start with a few patient stories because I think we can all make this a bit more personal by thinking about it in terms of certain individuals. And these individuals are mostly fictional, I should point out. Uh, the burger on the right of the screen is not fictional. Uh, and the burger on the right of the screen is the favorite uh, food of our 47-year-old executive. He's 220 pounds, 5 foot 11 inches tall, runs a little bit of a high blood pressure for those of you uh, who are familiar with those numbers. 155 over 90 is a little higher than the 120 over 80 we'd rather see. His favorite uh, dinner entertainment is to pop along to Carl's Jr. for the uh, guacamole bacon burger. I've, I've put the calorie count down here at the bottom just in case you were interested. Um, 1140 kilocalories in the burger alone. He likes to, to have a large fries with that. That's another 840 kilocalories, adding up to approximately 2,000, which is about the amount of calories you use up in a, in a normal day. So in, in, the, in the course of his burger and fries, he's used up all the calories he has to expend. He adds to it his Oreo cookie ice cream shake, another 740 kilocalories uh, for which he now has to exercise. Unfortunately, it's going to take him six and a half hours of walking to walk off this meal. And he doesn't have six and a half hours left in the day. So he's kind of our, our cliched uh, executive stereotype. And uh, he works too hard. He doesn't have enough time. He eats pretty badly. And one day he decides to get in shape because, of course, he's been uh, along to a talk at Stanford about uh, cardiac risk and thinks it's time to, to get moving. And so he starts by challenging a junior executive in his office to a game of racquetball. This really is the cliche. Uh, of course, he reaches the second set, clutches the middle of his chest, has 10 out of 10 chest pain, talks about an elephant sitting on his chest and is transferred to hospital. This is the one we all hope to avoid. Um, and it's certainly a cliche I think we're all familiar with. Here's a less familiar one, but maybe some of you in the audience know someone who fits this stereotype, a 75-year-old woman, a retired bookkeeper. In contrast to Mr. A, uh, she eats well, has very mild, high blood pressure, but so has some family history there. Her mother and sister suffered strokes at an older age she likes to, to walk, and she walks to the shops every day. But she's noticed of late, over the last few months, that she gets some chest pain when climbing the hill. This is a central chest pain in the middle of her chest. It's like a pressure, like a belt tightening around her chest. It spreads to the right, sometimes to the left, sometimes to her neck, sometimes to her jaw. But she stops when this happens. And she stops, and the chest pain goes away. And being someone who doesn't like to bother her physicians or bother her family, she hasn't told anyone about this. And she lives with this chest pain for quite some time. And that's our story of Mrs. B. Mr. C had a bolt from the blue. This is a man in his mid-50s who was previously very fit and healthy. Uh, very minimal kind of risk factors if you think about it. Normal blood pressure, very fit and healthy, exercising every day. Suddenly, in a way that nobody would expect, had an onset of chest pain while exercising. And very rapidly, a heart attack was diagnosed and he was transferred Im immediately to a, an excellent nearby healthcare facility. Let's call it Stanford, shall we? and uh, a stent was placed to a main artery, allowing the blood to return to the artery. And this is a picture of uh, this artery here, blocked at this point and opened up again here, allowing the blood and oxygen to get back to the heart muscle and saving that heart muscle that would otherwise die. And so these are stories, I think, that could happen to any of us. Uh, certainly, we probably all have thought of someone or we know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody that has a story much like this. Um, but especially in the case of Mr. C., I think it's a little bit hard to explain. I think it's not too surprising that Mr. A is having a heart attack. He's the cliche. Um, the chest pain that Mrs. B is having is maybe understandable. But this is the one that's a little confusing to us. And I think this is what was confusing about the Tim Russert story. Because uh, by the accounts from the popular press, two weeks before he had his heart attack, he had an exercise test and was told everything was all clear. 
And so what I hope to do over the next 10 minutes or so is just explain to you why that can be, because I've lost count of the number of patients who've asked me that and the number of people who are around. And I think given what we know and given what's reported in the papers, that is a mystery. How can you have an exercise test one day and a few days later have a heart attack? So hopefully we'll, we'll explain that a little bit to you. And it gets, to, it gets to this. What is artery disease anyway? What are we talking about when we're talking about coronary artery disease or artery disease in, in peripheral arteries or in the carotid arteries? Well, we have to, in order to understand that, we have to start with the cardiovascular system. And the whole system starts with the heart, and this is it beating in the middle of the screen. And the heart is really a glorious organ. I mean, we're biased here, but we, we think the heart is the most interesting and important organ of all. Uh, it has four chambers, four valves help the blood go in and out. Those valves have 10 leaflets. The 10 leaflets have five different little muscles in the middle. You can see them here that operate those valves. And these hearts beat three billion times in a lifetime. That's billion with a B. So this is a truly remarkable muscle. It's essentially never silent. If you pick up your shopping and walk along the road, your arms rapidly get tired. Your heart can't afford to get tired. It beats three billion times. And what does it do? Well, it pushes the blood around the body. So I've shown you here a picture on the left. These are red blood cells. You can see the, the little corpuscular shape. They're very small. Of course, in the blood, there are other cells. And the, the diagram here on the bottom left shows you that there's plasma. And that's the fluid that the cells are bathed in. Platelets are little tiny little cells that help with clotting. There's the white blood cells that help us respond to infection. And finally, the red blood cells make up about 50% of the volume of our blood. And that's them shown here at the bottom. What else do we need to know about the cardiovascular system? Well, <clears throat> what is an artery anyway? There are arteries and there are veins, and sometimes you hear us talking about the vasculature. Well, the arteries take the blood from the heart and they take it to the circulation and the veins return the blood back to the heart. Of course, one side of the heart, which is the right side shown here, sends the blood to the lungs, and that's where it receives its oxygen. And then that oxygenated blood goes back to the left-hand side of the heart shown here, and the oxygenated blood, which is red, is pushed out to the left side of the heart and goes around the body to these various capillary beds. So that's what we're talking about with the cardiovascular system. The heart is a central pump. The blood is being pushed around different cell types and the circulation of which there are arteries taking the oxygenated blood to the tissues and the veins taking it away. And the most important arteries, as far as we're concerned, are the coronary arteries, because they're the ones that take the blood and oxygen to the heart. So this is a CT angiogram. Some of you may even had one of these, a coronary CT, and we can do these lovely three-dimensional reconstructions that you see on the screen. This is actually one from a patient who's had a bypass operation. And so you can see not just the native coronary arteries, which are shown uh, around here, and just as it'll come round back into view near the top of this. So the main heart here, this is the aorta, the main artery of the body. And then here, for example, is a coronary artery. This is actually a bypass graft, and the native coronary artery is just here. So using these tools, as well as, a, as well as a coronary angiogram that some of you might have heard of, we can get really good pictures, not just of the inside of the heart, heart uh, the coronary arteries, which is what we used to get, what we call the lumen, really the channel where the blood flows, but we can now get pictures of the actual wall of the artery. And you'll see why that's important. So cholesterol, I think we've all heard of. That's the other, we're putting the building blocks here together to try and explain really more than anything else that, that Tim Russert story. We all have heard of cholesterol, what is it? Well, it comes about because we eat fat. So we eat fat and the body has to deal with it. And the problem is that lipids or fats are insoluble in water. So they, they're not, that means they don't dissolve in the blood. So the body has to find a way of dealing with them and the, the way the body deals with them is to package them. And it packages them in particles, particles of different sizes. And the particles basically are a combination of the fat, which is called lipo, uh, and lipid, and uh, protein. And so they're called lipoproteins. So lipoproteins are of different sizes. And at the, at the broadest spectrum, and we can divide them into as many sizes as we want, but you'll have heard potentially of low density, LDL, low density lipoprotein, and that's bad cholesterol. And you might also have heard of high density cholesterol, HDL, the one shown on the right of the screen here, which is the good cholesterol. It's good cholesterol because it takes the fat away from the tissues and helps it uh, be metabolized. The LDL is the bad one because it takes it to the tissues. So that's what cholesterol is. That's what LDL and HDL are. And these are the different building blocks of the story. So if I'd been giving you this talk, say, 20 years ago, for example, I think I'd be, I'd be giving you a slide somewhat like this. I'd be talking about plumbing. I'd be talking about how cardiologists are really glorified plumbers and that we like to think that we're very good at plumbing. 
we think of coronary arteries as a plumbing problem, and this is a pipe. I think it's actually from Israel. Uh, Google is an amazing thing. So here's a, here's a pipe that's been silted up with hard water in Israel. And this is how we used to think of a coronary artery. Eventually, after fat built up on the inner surface here of the artery, in time, it would eventually occlude the flow completely, a bit like down here. And at that point, we would have a heart attack. So that leads to the idea that there are two stages. There's the point at which the artery silts up here, and that would cause angina. In other words, the blood, not enough blood would reach the heart. But if you rest, as Mrs. B was doing, then and let the blood flow back and reduce the workload of the heart, that pain would go away. And then a complete blockage, which is a heart attack shown here at the bottom, where it just blocks up completely. But it turned out, like most things that are a little bit too good to be true, that that was completely wrong. And uh, I'm going to explain to you a little bit why it's wrong. Um, and it's certainly one of the reasons it's wrong is it doesn't help us explain these stories that I've mentioned to you. But as we are on our way to do that, I thought we'd pay some homage to some pioneers in cardiology. And we have uh, some here at Stanford, though I'm going to focus on two, one German here at the top for a quick story. Uh, and Mason Soans, who was chief at uh, one of our rival places, the Cleveland Clinic, but I think we'll, they'll, they'll let us off talking about that in the Stanford talk. So Werner Forsman was quite an amazing person. He'd read about this idea that you could pass a catheter, much like you see him doing on the picture on the screen there, through a vein into the heart of a horse. And he actually felt that this was a remarkable achievement. And for some reason, he decided that this would be kind of a useful thing to do in humans. Imagine if you could pass a catheter actually into the heart and measure pressures and look at pictures. He couldn't find any willing volunteers to be the first person to have a catheter passed into their heart. Hardly surprising, given that the first subject was a horse. But he volunteered himself, and that's what it's shown to be doing on the left-hand side. The thing is, he couldn't do it alone, because it's kind of hard. You have to, you have to cannulate the artery yourself. Uh, or in this case, the vein, and push the catheter up, and then you have to manipulate the x-ray device with, maybe with your foot to try and work out where it's going into your heart, take the pictures, send them off, and, and win your Nobel Prize. So he decided he needed a little bit of help. And not being able to ask his boss, who told him he was wasting his time and these were ridiculous ideas, he decided to uh, express some romantic interest in one of the nurses who worked in the cardiac catheterization lab. He did this quite successfully and managed to tempt her to a date. It didn't sound like a very exciting date because it was happening in the hospital in the cardiac catheterization lab. But he managed to uh, suggest that he wanted to just uh, meet after hours for pot potentially a romantic liaison. At which point he revealed his real, pl real plan, which was to carry out the first ever human cardiac catheterization, which is what's shown here. And uh, with some help of a mirror and this particular nurse, he did exactly that for the first time. He passed a catheter through his vein into his heart. Um, of course, he was roundly criticized for this. Everyone told him he was crazy and he lost his job. But he caused a revolution in cardiology. And really, the reason we're here and the reason I can show you pictures like the ones I can today is because of this guy. So uh, he, uh, he's an important pioneer. and I thought I would mention his story. One other one, Mason Soans, shown here on the right, has another interesting story. So he was in the 1950s. By this time, cardiac catheterization was routine. It had been done since Werner Forsman's days, and, and Werner Forsman had been vindicated, and uh, he, he was now a, a little bit, well, I wouldn't say a celebrity, because he was never really celebrated. But uh, Mason Soans was head of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic. So at that time, the most we could do with the heart was push dye into the heart, the main chamber of the heart. And then we did that with a very uh, powerful pump. It had to be done mechanically. And then you would look and see how the heart was pushing the blood out and get a sort of picture of how, how good the heart could pump. Nobody had ever thought for a minute of, of the coronary arteries. They were far too small, and it would be really dangerous to go anywhere near those. Um, the only thing we ever did was put contrast into the body of the heart. And so he, he was in the middle of a procedure. And he was working with a co-worker. And as he did in the 1950s, he decided to stop mid-procedure for a smoke. That's, that's a real story. <laughs> so uh, he walked six feet away from the patient where he picked up a sterile forceps and picked up a cigarette and started smoking. Because that's what you did as a cardiologist in the 1950s. You smoked in the middle of your cardiac catheterizations. And this took his eye off the ball somewhat, this smoking, because he didn't notice that the catheter, which was already in the patient's heart, had wandered out of the patient's heart and was now sitting in the coronary artery. He would have known that if he'd watched really carefully on the pressure tracing, but as it happened, he didn't see it. And so he said, go. And the uh, large, powerful pump pumped uh, very uh, vigorously 
contrast dye into his right coronary artery. Now, those of us who, uh, who, do, who do that for a living would appreciate that that's not a very good idea. And the patient promptly had a cardiac arrest, which got his attention. <laughs> and he put down his cigarette and went and started pounding on the patient's chest and trying to rescue the patient, which they did successfully. The patient survived. And so the story goes, just at the time that he was kind of wiping his brow and going, boy, that was a close one, he looked up on the screen and found that he'd taken a picture of the first ever coronary angiogram because there was this beautifully outlined picture of the right coronary artery on the screen. So he was the guy, and sometimes it's the craziest of stories that lead to these advancements that allowed us to, to do coronary angiography, um, partly because he was having a smoke in the middle of a procedure. Anyway, back to our plumbing. Uh, the simple plumbing basically doesn't fit with the evidence. I think that's, that's the problem, because we can think of people who've never had angina, never had chest pain, but have heart attacks. We can think of people who have severe angina, but never have heart attacks. That's maybe like, like our second patient. There's always the case that it was found that when we started to look in patients who, who tragically died with heart attacks and looked at all their coronary arteries, it wasn't always the severe narrowings that were responsible for the heart attacks and responsible for the main blockage. In fact, there's a picture here on the right of a real coronary artery from a human. And you can see the lesion here with some blood in it and the rupture of the lesion here and a clot that has formed on top of it. And if that clot is large enough to block entirely the blood in that artery, that's a heart attack. And it turned out when we looked carefully that it wasn't actually the most severe lesions that were breaking open. In fact, if you looked really carefully, it seemed to be the smaller lesions that were breaking open and causing heart attacks. So it didn't really, it didn't really add up. So we needed a new paradigm. We needed a new understanding of coronary artery disease past simple plumbing. And I'm going to outline for you by taking you kind of deep into this rather science fiction uh, view of the coronary artery, uh, what we now believe to be the case. And what we believe to be the case is that inflammation, and we've all heard of inflammation, and we know if you get a, a bite from a little bug or if you scrape your, your hand, uh, you get a redness around it. And that redness is, is inflammation. And that's what's really shown here. Here's the artery with all the blood flowing in it. There's the red blood cells. Here's some white blood cells. Little platelets are quite small. We don't really see them in this picture. Here's the different walls. We have an internal wall. Uh, we have, uh, this is called the endothelium. Uh, we have another couple of walls called the media, which has smooth muscle cells, and the adventitia, which is the wall on the outside. So what happens, here's our little, if you, it's a little small, I'm afraid, but here's our player, LDL. Here's a bad cholesterol there over on the left. And it breaks, out, breaks in and basically goes across the wall from the circulation into the uh, wall of the artery, where it becomes modified here. In fact, it becomes oxidized. And that becomes a very powerful stimulant of inflammation. And that inflammation causes changes to happen. It causes these little receptors to become available on the surface of the endothelial cells. And these white blood cells, which you might imagine rolling along that surface, become stuck now, a little bit like Velcro. And they become stuck there, and then they get kind of tempted in. They get pulled in like a magnet. You can see one of them here getting pulled into the cell wall. And then this, in this case, it's, this is a scavenging type cell called a macrophage. And it starts to eat up this cholesterol, and it transforms from being a macrophage into something called a foam cell, which is a, a cell that you can imagine is, is a kind of spongy cell that's packed full of cholesterol. And then those cells start to release their own mediators, which are all these little dots around here, and they, they continue to send signals now to these smooth muscle cells, which start to migrate, and here's them migrating from here on the left up to the top to form a cap. So now what you have is a bunch of these foam cells in the middle, these tightly packed cholesterol-filled cells, and a, and, a, and a cap that's called a fibrous cap that's made of these transformed smooth muscle cells. The, the cells that used to give the tone to the arteries transform themselves into more of a fibrous nature. And within this cell is lots of badness, basically, in this space. Lots of bad things are in there. And one of the bad things that's in there is something called tissue factor. It's a little small for you to see on the screen but it's, it's, it's shown over here. And this is a factor that's secreted by these cells that is the most prothrombotic, is the word we use, and what that means is it can stimulate a clot. So it's, the, it's one of the most clot-stimulating molecules that has ever been discovered, and it's sitting right there inside the plaque in the coronary artery. And that's fine, as long as it stays there, as long as it stays inside this plaque, inside the other side of the fibrous cap, we're fine. The problem is, if that fibrous cap has a little erosion, or worse still, ruptures, that tissue factor comes out and if, if affects its, its uh, bad effects onto the bloodstream, 
and causes a clot. And that clot is also called a thrombus, which is what you see here. And this is a heart attack in action on this page. What's happened is, is the, the plaque has built up here. These foam cells are here. The, the, the uh, fibrous cap has, has ruptured open and a clot has formed. And so with this new view, I think we can begin to see a slightly different picture. <clears throat> we can see a picture of stable plaque, which has a very hard cap, very thick cap. And that means that the, the bad stuff, the tissue factor, the stuff that causes clots, is kept very tightly inside that. And in fact, those lesions can be even pretty severe. In other words, they can, be, they can clog up the artery, but like this one here, very significantly, but they're fixed. And as long as they don't rupture open to cause a clot, there might never be a heart attack there. And it turns out that actually, as you get more severe lesion, more severe narrowing here, it becomes perhaps even more stable. There's a suggestion that it's more stable and less likely to rupture. And that's perhaps the situation again with our second patient. Of course, the situation that we're, where we really want to avoid is this, an unstable plaque. And that's a plaque with very thin wall, instead of that really thick fibrous cap holding in the really bad stuff that caused the clots, there's a very thin cap and it can be disrupted. It can be disrupted by erosion or it can be disrupted by rupture. And in Mr. A or Mr. C's case that we described earlier, that's what happened. And the fact is that you don't need to have a severe lesion for this to happen and in fact, it's often the, the, not the smaller lesions, the ones that don't cause the complete blockage in, in, in a stable way that cause the complete blockage by, by causing a clot. And, and what's happened is that we've come up with a new term, vulnerable plaque, uh, to describe this plaque that's sitting there that can potentially open up at any point and cause a heart attack. The problem is we don't have any way of identifying vulnerable plaque. We know it's there. We have a much better understanding of the disease. But unfortunately, despite these wonderful scans that I showed you, the angiograms that were the result of uh, Mason Soane's efforts at the Cleveland Clinic, the CT angiograms with the rotating three-dimensional heart, they can tell us about the wall of the heart. They're pretty good at telling us about these uh, tight lesions where there's a very significant blockage. But nowhere do we have a scan that can put a red flag on one of these vulnerable plaques and say, here's the problem. And so what we've tended to do in cardiology is stent what we can see. And we've been using these balloons in the first instance by blowing a balloon up in a coronary artery and then secondary using a stent, a little metal cage that can grow up. And we've tended to do that with, with what we can see. And what we could see are the very tight narrowings. And we can take away chest pain, there's no question. We can relieve angina with those stents. The problem is that we could stent a very tight lesion that maybe was never going to cause a heart attack but was causing chest pain and we can improve the chest pain. But right next to it, we could miss a vulnerable plaque that might, three days down the road, rupture and cause a heart attack. And so that, that's really the reason we have these paradoxes, is that we're very good with the plumbing part. For many years, we're good if the lesions are very tight and you have a, a flow limitation. In other words, there's a bit of the heart that just can't get enough blood. You put someone on a treadmill, we do the stress test, or maybe they come with chest pain because they are walking up their favorite hill. And we, we can fix that. We're pretty good at that. But so far, we're not very good using stents anyway at dealing with a vulnerable plaque. So fortunately, because that would, be a, that would not be a good place to end, <laughs> this talks about risk. And uh, what we're wanting to do is avoid risk. Now there's a simple way this particular man could avoid risk, I think, by moving out from underneath his truck. Whilst we don't have it in the stents of a proven method of finding vulnerable plaque and stopping it rupture, we do in identifying risk factors and doing something about them. And so I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so uh, talking about risk um, and how to uh, help and how to reduce your risk. And these are the classic risk factors that we know and talk about, and maybe some of you have talked to your own cardiologists or uh, general practitioners about these risks. We sometimes skip over the ones we can't change, but no question that sex, age, and family history are significant cardiovascular risk factors. We're not going to focus too much on them tonight because we don't yet have a way of changing our sex, our age, or family history, although perhaps at least one of those is arguable. But what we do have is a way of changing some of the others, and I think these will be familiar to many of you in the audience. Cholesterol, we talked about that. Blood pressure, diabetes, exercise, smoking, obesity. And some of them are related, of course, obesity and diet, alcohol, and stress. And those are the ones I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about over the next little while. I've put a list of a few others in there, and some of them maybe you know, have you scratching your head. Some of these other ones, the newer ones, the ones that are a little less well-validated. But I'm going to focus on the big ones. 
So what's at stake? This is what we're talking about. Well, there was an absolutely huge uh, study, a really important study called InterHeart that was patients from 52 countries around the world, published just two or three years ago. And what it showed was that of these modifiable risk factors, they, they came up with nine. Uh, I had a six or seven on the last page. Um, but they accounted for 90% of the risk of the first heart attack. So that means that you can change 90% of the risk. I mean, for all you have the genetics and your age and your sex, you, you have under your control 90% of the risk. And there are real significant benefits. If you have that risk, we should be able to demonstrate that by reducing risk, we can reduce the risk of an event. And there are, are very large studies that have also shown that. In one study uh, of nurses, in fact, the nurses' health study, 84% reduction in cardiovascular uh, risk. And in another study, 55%. So these are not small numbers. There are very significant things that we can change. And that's what's at stake. So cholesterol. We talked a little bit about what cholesterol was already in kind of more theoretical terms. I, I love these eggs, I think, from a, a breakfast shop in Thailand. Uh, Heart-shaped eggs. You can get your, your full weekly dose of cholesterol in one, uh, in one fell swoop. These are the, the traditional patterns that we think about. LDL, HDL. Uh, triglyceride and, and sometimes you'll hear about VLDL. You might hear about even some other things like lipoprotein little a or some other uh, things more modern. But for the most part, you hear about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And uh, clearly the eggs are probably an indication of bad cholesterol. Fortunately, we have a way of dealing with cholesterol. The first way is diet. And we'll talk a bit about diet on, a, on another slide. So that's always the first thing. And it's diet is, good diet is something we can all do. Uh, but of course, uh, in the 1990s, uh, we actually found, really stumbled upon uh, medicines that became very effective, not just at reducing cholesterol, but saving lives. And these are the medicines known as the statins. And I've shown you just one graph here on the right of the screen, which is from one of the early studies showing the very positive benefits. And for those of you who can't read the, the axis on the, it's a little small, uh, the axis on the Y is total deaths. And what you do is plot during the years of the study, here shown years one to six, the deaths for the group who had the placebo and, and the, the deaths for the group who had the statin medicine, in this case, pravastatin. And you can see that even from a very early stage, even back at year one, and even earlier, perhaps, here the lines begin to diverge, there's, there's very many fewer deaths in the pravastatin group. And this was then mirrored with many other statin medications and many other trials, not just for primary prevention, for those who'd never had a, an event, and we were treating risk factors, but also for secondary prevention for people who'd had a, an event and we were wanting to avoid the next event. Um, so that's cholesterol. Always starts with diet, but we have many good medications, predominantly the statin medications. And today's talk is more general about risk, but again, I can talk a bit more about cholesterol and other potential medications. We have a lot in our armory now, and really in most cases we can get people down to a goal uh, cholesterol and significantly reduce the risk. That's the risk of a heart attack. So these medicines, one of the things they do is stabilize those plaques. Uh, they can make them shrink a little. They're not dramatic at, at shrinking them. They can make them shrink a little. But as we noticed, it's not the size that matters. It's the makeup of the, of the plaque that matters and whether it's stable with a very, uh, with a very uh, thick uh, cap or whether it's soft with a thin cap. And these medicines can, can change those uh, plaques. So these are uh, some of the thresholds, just a little bit more uh, detail on the statins. Uh, we mentioned the diet and everyone. And these are numbers uh, that you may be familiar with or, or maybe not, but I think 190 for everyone. These are numbers for LDL, the low density uh, cholesterol. And those are the thresholds for treating. And what we try to do these days is make a kind of risk score. And you can do this yourself even if, if you're interested on the internet pretty easily. Uh, you can type in your age and your sex and a few other things, your blood pressure, and come up with a score. And if you reach above the certain risk level uh, and you know your cholesterol, you can work out whether maybe you should be taking, at least according to the current guidelines, uh, these statins. In those with a previous event, there's a little bit more debate about whether to go straight with the high doses of the medicines we know, which have generally been tested in the studies, or to actually go with a, a goal. In other words, let's aim for 70 milligrams per deciliter of, of LDL. And that's a current, uh, current debate. Well, what about blood pressure? We've talked about that. Uh, blood pressure is probably known to, to most of you, but let me just go over it again, because doctors, of course, love to give strange Latin names to almost everything that we do, just so that no one can understand anything we say. And uh, blood pressure is no exception. It's made up of two numbers, and it's made up of two numbers because essentially we're measuring the pressure in a tube. The tube is your arteries, and that tube has blood flowing through it, but it's flowing through it because the heart is pumping. 
And every time the heart pumps, there's a wave of high pressure that goes through as the blood travels down the, down the artery. And then, of course, that pressure drops off. And then there's another beat, and the pressure goes up, and the pressure goes down. And there's those two pressures, the high pressure and the lower pressure, are what we call systolic and diastolic. And that's why there's two pressures. Also, just to be confusing, we, we give another term to the difference between those two pressures, which is the pulse pressure. And what the big studies have found is that all of those pressures are associated with risk. It may, you may have heard uh, earlier, in earlier days that mainly was the systolic blood pressure, the top number we were interested in. Then we went through a phase where it was the bottom number we were interested in, and so we paid more attention to the bottom number. And then we went through a phase where it was the difference between the two that we were interested in, and I think now we understand that it's all of those numbers that we're interested in. And if any one of your numbers is high, it's something that really requires some attention and requires some treatment, because all of those are associated with risk. Normal blood pressure, we mentioned a little bit earlier, that would be less than 120 over 80, and the pressure units are millimeters of mercury. We tend to not use the mercury so much anymore, uh, but we do still measure in millimeters of mercury. More recently, there's been an interesting, a little bit of a controversy uh, because of something that was defined as pre-hypertension. Um, and, and that was defined because it, it, really because of the graphs you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. And this is another of these risk graphs where if you're lower on the graph, here's men on the top and women on the bottom, it's better. And what they found was that if you were in the sort of normal, normal range of blood pressure, as in below 120 over 80, uh, you actually did a little better than if you were in the higher normal range, sort of nearer the 130s over sort of mid 80s. And that led to a very controversial decision, which was to come up with the idea of pre-hypertension. And these were people in whom they had other risk factors we should consider treating, even at these low levels. But if they didn't have other risk factors, then maybe we would just watch them. So that's a little bit confusing. Uh, but I think what, is, what there's no question of, and there's no debate of, and there has not been debate for many years, is that if you have a blood pressure above 140 over 90, then you need some treatment. There are many different treatments, but we always start with the simple ones, lifestyle, diet. We're, we're coming to it. Uh, we started with it, but we're, we're coming to a slightly better than our guacamole uh, $6 burger. Um, exercise and reduction of stress. The therapy we use are diuretics, and these are particular diuretics that are very mild. They're very mild in terms of the, 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 the amount that they make you lose water. That's what a diuretic does, it makes you lose water. Really what they do is, is dilate your blood vessels, and that's really their mechanism of action. You might have heard of ACE inhibitors. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. And the angiotensin converting enzyme is, is a, a kind of nasty player that produces something called angiotensin II. And angiotensin II is a little molecule that zooms around the body. It's, it zooms around and is also present in local organs. And it, it's basically a bad actor. It does pretty bad things at the level of the heart, at the level of the kidney, tightens up the blood vessels, and uh, basically causes harm. So by giving ACE inhibitors, we can stop that nasty uh, molecule and then also reduce blood pressure because it, it's, it's something that increases blood pressure. You might also have heard of, heard of calcium channel blockers why would you want to block a calcium channel? Well, the, the little smooth muscles that I mentioned to you that are in every artery, we saw them migrating, those little muscle cells migrate up to, cause the, to form the cap. Well, the ones that don't migrate up are the, there in the blood vessel because they need to cr cr create tone. In other words, your, your, your pulse, when you feel it, is, is, uh, is, has, has pressure. And the, that's, there's pressure there that's held in place by the muscles that are in a ring structure uh, in that blood vessel. And the reason they're able to hold tone is because calcium enters from the outside into those little muscles, and uh, the calcium activates the little muscles. So if we want to relax that artery, one way of doing it is blocking the calcium that goes into those cells. So these are three of the most common therapeutics that we use for treatment of high blood pressure. And I hope that nobody in the room is on quite as many pills as we see on the right of the screen. So I, I promised you a better diet than the guacamole $6 Carl's Jr. burger. And I think probably this uh, hamster, is it a hamster or a guinea pig? It's a guinea pig. Probably has the right idea about diet, but uh, maybe my message to you is that you don't have to go quite as far as uh, eating a, a guinea pig diet in order to have a heart healthy diet. And you hear a different thing about diet every day of the week. And you hear a different diet and a different fad. And depending on what decade you look, you'll find completely different advice. And that can be very confusing. But despite all of that, there are actually some things that basically everybody agrees on and pretty much everybody has agreed on now for more than 10 years. And uh, it's, you know, so it seems to be pretty robust. And that's this, that if you're going to have fat and you should try and have not too much fat in your diet, then it should be unsaturated fat. 
If you're going to have carbohydrate, and most of the, the um, guidelines suggest that the, the principal component or the largest of the three components be carbohydrate, then it should be in whole grains. That's complex carbohydrates, not the kind of sugars you get on a Krispy Kreme donut. Fruits and vegetables, I think that's not a surprise to anybody here. They are high in fiber uh, and they're independently very healthy uh, as, a, as a, a method of, and you can see our, our furry creature on the right is uh, showing, showing the way ahead in terms of the fruits and vegetables. And finally, a more recent story has been these omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, these are, are found in fish, fish oil supplements, uh, or some other plant sources. And really, of all the supplements and uh, vitamins that you can get in the various stores that are there, most of them, I have to tell you, don't have a lot of evidence base uh, in, in the medical literature. But fish oil is one that absolutely does. And uh, that's been a more recent story. The, the, the bullet points above that have been uh, there, for, there and kind of consensus opinion for a while. But uh, fish oil is a, is a newer one. Well, what, what, when my patients ask me about alcohol, I usually make the point that as long as it's very high quality scotch <laughs> from uh, uh, Scotland, then they should probably be okay. And so I thought I'd include a picture of some of my favorite ones here. You might detect uh, from my accent that I didn't originally come from California. And uh, in fact, my home is right here, uh, Glasgow in Scotland, surrounded, as you can see, by some of the best Scottish malt whiskey in the world. Um, Despite that, my advice to you is everything in moderation. Uh, you may have heard that moderate or small amounts of alcohol can actually be protective, and that actually is true. A lot of the research uh, was funded by some of the wine companies who were here in Napa Valley originally, and of course they had a, a reason to fund the research, but that doesn't mean the research was false. Uh, in fact, it does seem that small amounts of alcohol on a daily basis are protective of cardiac events. The type of alcohol, for all we hear about the red wine in the Mediterranean, seems to be less relevant. The safe limits are not very high. One drink for women per day and two for men. Uh, and for most of the people under the age of 40, actually, there probably isn't really much of a benefit. Um, and certainly what is clear is that if you take more than one drink for women and two for men, the benefit is extinguished or balanced with other risks pretty quickly. So I think the alcohol story is one sort of source of light in this uh, lifestyle change for you. Um, a glass of wine a day will actually do you some good. Well, these are some words that you may have heard a bit more of recently. Obesity, we've heard here a lot about. It's on the rise, it's present in our children. Uh, diabetes is one of the inevitable causes, and the metabolic syndrome is something you probably have heard a lot about. Um, well, a waistline like this is something we're all trying to avoid or work against. And uh, these, the metabolic syndrome has, has been debated a lot. But the metabolic syndrome, and what it comes down to is these things that are mentioned here on the, on the bullet points. Uh, it's really the, the conglomeration of these different things, the sort of coexistence of these things, high blood pressure, obesity, and, and I've, the picture is there for a reason, because obesity we classify in different ways. It can be central, as in abdominal, or it can be more, you can be more pear-shaped, where the, the, uh, the fat is spread a little bit further down um, and around the front and the back. Um, but the abdominal obesity is central, seems to be particularly a, a risk factor. And it's associated with particular patterns of cholesterol, high triglyceride and low HDL. That's a good cholesterol. And actually, it's one of the Stanford faculty who's been responsible more than any other for the, the research, I think, into this metabolic syndrome, although he himself would prefer we didn't use the term, and I certainly agree with him, because the underlying uh, pathophysiology, as we call it, in other words, the underlying disease explanation is based around insulin. And insulin is what goes wrong with, with diabetes. And it goes wrong in two ways. If diabetes in, in younger kids is caused by not enough insulin because the pancreas doesn't make enough um, and the, the cells are resistant to it. But um, in older people who get diabetes, the problem is really that there's too much insulin. And it's because the cells are resistant to the insulin. And so the answer to insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome and the diabetes that people get when they're older is not more insulin. It's actually lifestyle change of the type that we've been talking about. Uh, to mention quickly about hormone replacement therapy, because this is something that, that changed quite a lot recently. We know that coronary heart disease increases postmenopause in women. We assumed it was, it was because of the low estrogen that is the case there. And there were a number of observational studies, so small studies that weren't, didn't have randomization or placebo controls, suggested there was benefit for heart uh, risk uh, of the combined HRT. But really, that, that uh, was given the lie by two very large trials published just in the last few years that demonstrated no benefit of that combined HRT and the possibility of harm, and I've shown you another of these 
uh, pictures here on the right that you're getting used to. In this case, you really want to see your intervention, remember, as a, as a lower line. And in this case, the placebo is here in blue and the, the combined HRT is shown in red. So that really changed practice pretty quickly when those large studies uh, as well as uh, came out, as well as testing, teaching us the lesson that really we need to do randomized trials where we give one, uh, with the toss of a coin, we give one patient the, the real medicine and someone else a placebo because otherwise we can be led very far astray. Well, as at least uh, two people in the room know very well, um, there are a few benefits of exercise. Uh, I hope you all do. And I've listed just uh, 25 or so off the top of my head. Um, I, could have, I could go on, and uh, no, no doubt I, I will at other times. Uh, but since time is short tonight, I'll let you read the list. There are so many benefits of exercise, and it does all the right things. It decreases the risk of stroke, heart attack, cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, improves your mood, improves your sleep, reduces diabetes, improves your cholesterol, improves your agility, your endurance. It reduces back pain. Your bone density is better. Your immune system is better. It reduces inflammation. Your muscle metabolism is better. Do I need to go on? Probably not. Exercise is a good thing, and we need to all do more of it. So what are you waiting for? I thought this was kind of amusing, <laughs> these guys taking the escalator uh, up to their 24-hour fitness uh, thing, <laughs> probably driving in their large SUVs to the door. Um, but anyway, I'm sure they had a good workout while they were there. Walking is good. It doesn't need to be lycra. It doesn't need to be jogging. It doesn't need to be running out in public. You can walk around the block. You can go to a gym and walk. The, the answer is it needs to be regular. It needs to be at least moderate intensity and preferably four to six times a week. Potentially for 30 minutes would probably be best. So that's uh, exercise. What are you waiting for? Um, stress is a something that, again, and, and this plays into our first patient, uh, Mr. A, who had the stressful executive job. One of the interesting things is that stress, even amongst very large populations, we think of stress as work stress. What do I need to get done today? You know, I'm late for this meeting, or I'm late to do this, or this, why is the stoplight here, or why is this guy driving like this? Um, but stress can affect whole populations. And here was a study where they looked at the number of heart attacks every day in 1998 at the time of the World Cup final. Uh, so the World Cup is the, is the World Cup of, of football. And so it's most of the nations that have a serious team, including the US. The US has a really good football team, in fact. Or a pretty good football team, let's say. Uh, they haven't won the World Cup, but they're pretty good. And so they looked at how many heart attacks there were in the days leading up to the World Cup in France. This is, the, this is the year that France won the World Cup, I should remind you. And how many there were on the days following. And I hope you can make out the graph here. It's a little bit small. You won't make out the text. But the place where the arrow is, is the day of the World Cup final. So here's the number of heart attacks. Day, 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 day. And then France won the World Cup. Boom. <laughs> many, many less heart attacks on that day. And then the next day, it was back up again and bounced around a little bit. It was a little lower this day, too. <coughs> And you can show the opposite. They actually did a classic study a few years before this, a couple of years before this in Holland, when Holland lost a very significant game in the World Cup final, and the bar went the other way. Um, so stress is a real thing. And whether it's football, or it's the meeting you're late for, or other thing, stressful life events undoubtedly affect cardiovascular risk. It's something that we can do something about, whether it's relaxation, whether it's talking to your partner, talking to your friends, or seeing a counselor or a, a specialist. There are ways of dealing with stress, and it's a very significant risk factor. So I've come to the end of the part where I uh, talk a bit, and I have a, a little uh, extra piece for you just at the end as we move into the questions. But I wanted to summarize just what I said uh, so far before we move into that. Um, artery disease comes in different forms, that's the message. If we're trying to understand what, what happened with Tim Russert, you know, how, do you, how do you have an exercise test one day and a heart attack the next? And the, the reason is that you can have stable plaque that can be very severe and limit the flow of blood to the heart, or you can have vulnerable plaque, and those plaques can actually be smaller. In fact, when we look at them, they do tend to be smaller. So we're less likely to be able to find them with the imaging test that we have. The good news is, we understand very well what the risk factors are. And they, 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 they can explain 90% of the risk of having a heart attack. And most of them are modifiable. And you can reduce your risk by 50%, by 80%, by paying attention to diet and exercise and your cholesterol and blood pressure. And so it's a very positive message uh, I want to, to leave you with, um, at least in, in for this part of the, of the talk. For the last part, I want to take you back to one of, one of our cases. Because remember the curious case of Mr. C? Here it is again. This was a, a, a man in his mid-50s who was previously fit and healthy, uh, had very few risk factors, normal blood pressure, good diet, who was exercising one day, 
Turns out it was Christmas Day a couple of uh, years ago and had sudden onset of chest pain while exercising. He had a heart attack diagnosed and was transferred to the hospital where a stent was placed. I tell you about this because Mr. C is not actually Mr. C, he's Mr. B and he's sitting in the front row and he kindly agreed to come along tonight and tell you his story from his point of view because it's all very well hearing about this stuff from me uh, but to hear about the story, one of the stories that we've had uh, and, and to hear a little bit from him I thought would be a nice thing for you to do so I'd like to ask Mr. Berman to come up and we'll, we'll talk a little bit. Sure. So I was going to ask you, Stuart, first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the time of your life before any of this happened. What, how did you regard yourself? Uh, quite fit. Um, as a matter of fact, I am a former football or soccer player, having played it for you know a good 30 years or so. And um, I exercised four times a week at least. I ride my bike whenever, whenever possible instead of taking the car. Um, so I was in great shape. And so uh, it was kind of holiday season and uh, you were feeling fine, in great shape as usual, exercising as usual. Tell, tell us a little bit what happened. All right, so uh, Christmas morning, I was, went to the YMCA at Page Mill Road with my wife to work out and about five minutes into exercising, really just warming up. I, I hadn't been exercising hard at all at that point. I started feeling a little bit bad, so I went and sat down for a few minutes. I got back and started exercising again. I started feeling bad, and I, I went through this cycle about three times. And uh, then I went and sat down for a while. I finally went and said to my wife, who was on one of the other exercise machines, I feel really bad. Would you take me over to Palo Alto Medical Clinic? And while she was, she went to the, um, to the locker room to get her keys. And while she was in the locker room, things got really bad. And I was really fortunate that there was somebody, one of the workers at the Y did exactly the right thing. She took a, a look at me and immediately called 911. So um, I was picked up by five paramedics, one of whom was the husband of Dr. Ashley's nurse. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a, Palo Alto's a small world. <laughs> They move fast, these uh, paramedics. So, uh, so clearly something was wrong. This wasn't right. Somebody called 911 pretty fast. You were obviously not feeling great at the time, but the, the, the good thing was they were pretty close by and were able to make it pretty quickly. Do you have a, any sense of how fast were they able to make it? The, uh, the fire station where the paramedics were located is about a quarter of a mile away from the Page Mill Y. And I think I, uh, before I blacked out, I think I, I re well, I know I remember hearing a siren and that was about it. But it, so it couldn't have been, I, I know that having talked to the paramedics after the event, they say that they have to be often, often rolling within a minute of when they get a call. So it probably wasn't more than three minutes from the time the call was made that, um, that the paramedics arrived. Not everyone chooses their gym according to where the local paramedics are, but uh, maybe they should. Well, in the future, I will, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I do. So they moved pretty fast, and so you, were, you were in the ambulance at that point and on your way to, to Stanford Hospital. Um, I, I don't know how much you recall of that time, but they moved you pretty rapidly. One of the things, one of our, our watchwords about uh, acute heart attacks is that time is muscle. We talked about the heart muscle here, and the longer that that artery is closed, the, the less chance there is of recovering that heart muscle function. So we, so we have a, a mandate to move as fast as possible. And in this case, we, we, try, we pick a number. We try to say, if we can get someone from the door into the cath lab and put a wire, as I'll show you in a moment, across the lesion in the heart, we try to do that within 90 minutes. And I think we actually maybe even did a little better in your case. I, th I think it was a, just a touch under 90 minutes. Yeah. And by bypassing the emergency room and by trying to smooth those procedures so that if there's somebody with an acute heart attack coming in, things can move fast, we really can get people to the point of opening the artery. I mentioned earlier that uh, sometimes with the stents, we, we can't be sure are we going to find a vulnerable plaque. Well, the situation uh, when somebody's having a heart attack is completely different. They have an artery that's closed. And what, ha what needs to happen is that artery needs to be opened. 
And if we can open that with a balloon and a wire and a stent, we can save the muscle and potentially uh, save a life. And so in that case, stents are undoubtedly uh, life-saving. And in much of the controversy that you may have read about stents over the last year, uh, we sometimes forget that in those acute settings, these are life-saving and, the, and the, the, the evidence for that is very clear. And some of it is, is on the screen here. What do you remember? Do you remember anything about the procedure? I know that they, uh, while I was in the cath lab, they did bring me to at one point so that I could look at, is that actually that's mine? That's, that's actually fine, yours. wow, that's, yeah. that's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> so that I could look at that, and um, I remember, you know, a, a nurse in uh, surgical room garb, and that was, and they said, well, that's it, we're gonna put a stent in there, and then that's all I remember, because I guess they put me under again. So let me, uh, it's, it's a little slow, because it's coming from the, um, it's coming from the CD, but let me uh, show you the actual picture. Um, so this is the picture taken in real time uh, uh, by a colleague of mine, Dr. Lee. Um, this is the left side of the heart. This is the left main coronary artery. You have a very big system. This is artery called the circumflex, this one here. And uh, some people have a main artery coming off, off, off the right or the artery to the bottom of the heart comes off the right and you have a little, uh, the bottom of the heart supplied by both sides. But really the artery at the top here is the one where the problem is you might identify right there, there's a blockage. And there's a little bit of contrast going into this artery here. It's beginning uh, to, to open here by itself, uh, but it's still blocked up, and this whole part of the heart is not receiving blood. So let's see uh, what was done about that. So did, were you, did you still have chest pain going on when you were in the, the cath lab? Well, you, you may not recall, but I never had chest pain. I had pain across, uh, across my, my neck, upper shoulders and neck and the central back so it wasn't I guess it wasn't the classic sort of pain. Well that's an important lesson I think too because I, I think if, if we're looking just for the elephant in the chest and especially this is true for women I didn't have much time to talk about it today but it tends to be that often the chest pain that comes with heart attacks for women sometimes is much less than that typical one that we've heard explained the elephant on the chest the belt tightening sometimes it, it, it can be another place. The monkey on the monkey on the back right. is that it? Or? That would be fine yeah <laughs> So let's see. So there you can see a wire now in that artery. And this is uh, Dr. Lee is at this point starting to uh, open up this artery. And the first thing to do is put a little wire. And the, the person actually who first had the idea of putting a wire down into an artery is a Stanford uh, person, Dr. Uh, John Simpson. And so that acts as a, uh, a kind of rail for the balloon to go on. And this is the balloon there you can see in the middle of the screen. And the balloon is inflated. And then the balloon is also used to blow up a, a stent. Uh, which is what they were doing here. Uh, the reason you see it on screen is because we put a little contrast inside a syringe that is used to blow up the, the balloon. And the stent, of course, in order to fit into the artery, has to be tightened around. Um, and it's kind of squeezed into a very narrow form. And so now that the, the stent has actually been placed, and so they're taking a picture with the artery open, and look at the, look at the beautiful flow that is now coming down to the bottom right of the screen down past this part that was previously uh, occluded, coming down here. And then you can see, if you look just before the, the contrast dye comes in, I'll point the arrow to it just here, there. Do you see it? I'll, you can maybe wait till the next time. You can see the stent now, just there. Do you see it? There's a kind of dark area just at this point in the artery. Look just before the dye, there. And that's the stent that has opened up the clot that was in the lesion that was supplying the the, the principal part of, of the, the blood flow. So that was the heart attack and the pain that you'd had, which was atypical, as I remember now, had gone away a little bit. Uh, what were the next few days like? I, I think I, uh, let's see, it was, I went to, started exercising at the Y at about 8.30 in the morning and by 1.30 in the afternoon, I remember I was awake in my hospital room and I said to him, okay, I feel fine, can I go? <laughs> and, uh, Really, I was, I, I pretty much felt fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, no ongoing problems there, at, thereafter. I was in the, in the hospital, I think they kept, kept me in for three days um, through, a Saturday, through a Saturday morning, I think, and Dr. Ashley said, okay, on Monday you can go back to the Y and start exercising again, which I did. And you have done ever since? And I have done ever since.
So the first thing is we measure how severe a heart attack is by lots of different ways, but one of them is by measuring a blood test at the time. And uh, one of the great things in Stuart's case was that the blood test at the time we measured showed very little damage. Um, and it's not uncommon to have a number for that. It's an enzyme called CK, creatine kinase. It's found only in the heart muscle cells. It can be 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 is not uncommon. In his case, it was 500. So that gives us an indication that we got there fast enough, or he got himself to us fast enough to avoid the damage. The next thing we do is look at the function, both treadmill function and how, what does the heart look like on an ultrasound test. And the great thing again is his heart function is, is overall completely normal. And in fact, uh, he's being even a little modest about his exercise uh, tolerance. We, we present it as a predicted, you know, what, how much would an average person have? And he has an exercise tolerance that's 150% of predicted. Um, and we have some professional uh, we have some professional sports people who come to my clinic who have numbers that are in that range. So he really did, uh, does ex exceptionally well. Well, what it demonstrates, I think, and I, I'm in absolute agreement with that, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of lifestyle change first and lifestyle change in the middle and lifestyle change at the end. I mean, we have medications, but uh, diet is a huge part of that. And we talk about that a lot in clinic. Um, I, I think I'd be a huge supporter of, of what this doctor was doing. We do hear sometimes that, in, and there are many patients, clearly these patients did well, there are some in whom diet is not going to be enough to reduce their cholesterol. We do understand there are uh, family uh, inherited genes that, uh, that sometimes will mean that you need medications to get the cholesterol down. But there's no question that with a good diet you can make a very significant difference. Oil is a very interesting thing. That for, I mean, for a long time we believed olive oil is, is healthy. I mean, olive oil is more healthy than other oils, and sunflower oil is more, you know, essentially unsaturated fats are, are better than other fats. But overall, it's everything in, in moderation. It's the, the overall amount of, of oil and fats in the diet has to be low. Because uh, ultimately, as we mentioned, the cholesterol that's going around your bloodstream as lipoproteins has to come from somewhere, and it basically comes from your diet. We focus a lot, especially in the United States, we focus a lot on lowering the bad cholesterol, the LDL, the low-density lipoprotein. And the question is, what can we do to raise the HDL, which is the good cholesterol, we want more of it. And I, I, I wish I could give a better answer. Actually, the, there are many, uh, if we think first of all about therapeutics, there are many uh, companies out there who are desperate to find a medication that can raise the HDL. And there was one that had a very spectacular fall uh, last year that was, was going to be a big hit for one particular company and really is, is not available because of, um, because of, of some side effects. Um, so we're really interested in being able to do that. The good news is, did I mention exercise was good? Well, exercise increases your HDL. Uh, diet can increase your HDL. Basically, the things we've been talking about can do both things. They can reduce the LDL, they can increase the HDL and they're very beneficial. So when I was being uh, dismissed from the hospital, one thing that they do, I guess with all heart attack patients before they let them go is to have the dietician come in and tell you what you can eat and they have your husband or wife there uh, so that whoever does the cooking can help out. So the the dietician started telling my wife and I what, uh, what, I, what we could eat and what a good diet would be. And we kind of started to, first we started to smile and then we kind of started to laugh. And we said to her, you know, this diet is so much more unhealthy than, than what we eat that this is great that we can eat all this stuff. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I, I exercised. Um, regularly, I ate correctly, there was, there's just, and there was no, no family history, so there was just no indicator that, um, that we know of. And stress? No, no more so, no more so than uh, anything in the, the Western American culture, I would think. One of the reasons that Stuart's story came to mind when we were thinking about this and thinking about the, the Tim Russert link and then thinking about trying to help explain 
uh, the idea of plaque is how can someone who has a great healthy lifestyle who exercises regularly have a heart attack? And the reason is that we all have plaques. I don't want to send you away kind of scared because I'm, I'm hoping to send you away with the optimistic message that you can change this stuff. But we all have plaques in some studies uh, of, of children. I'm talking kids as young as 10 years old who've died in tragic uh, accidents. If you look at the coronary arteries of 10 year old kids in the United States and around the world, they already have these plaques. They're little fatty streaks and they're present already at that age. So the fact is that every one of us in this room has coronary artery disease. Some of us might have quite severe lesions with thick caps. We might even get a little bit of angina on the way out, who knows? Some of us, I hope not, but uh, come and see me later if you do. <laughs> um, uh, some of us might have little uh, plaques that are regressing because we've changed our lifestyle recently, but we, but we all have plaques in there. And I think I didn't show you the right-hand side of, of Stuart's uh, uh, there's another story actually in, in the arteries on the right hand side because he has a, he has a little lesion, had, let me say, had a little lesion on a very distal portion of one of his right coronary arteries and we, they didn't stent it at the time, there was no necessity to do that. And we talked about what we would do about that and we decided that even though he had a good lifestyle and everything else, we would, we would go even further and, and, and really do even more of the same and see if he could actually regress those lesions and, and make a, a change that we saw as a very subtle change on his first exercise test disappear. And in fact, a year later when we did the second exercise test, it had gone. And so I think, although we didn't repeat the angiogram because that would involve having to put in another wire into the heart, uh, we did have evidence that continuing the, the good lifestyle factors can actually change uh, disease in the arteries, in, in Stuart's arteries. So I think that the message really and the answer to Sadna's question is really that we all have disease. And I really would refer you back to the, that inter-heart study. I think these numbers are amazing. 90% of the risk uh, and it can be explained. Um, so really, what, although I think that the Stuart's story is a great one to help us understand the idea of vulnerable plaque, the fact is most people have risk factors. He's, he's the anomaly. Um, most people have risk factors, and most, in most cases, they can be modifiable. These are ones that inhibit the effect of adrenaline, which is our fight or flight hormone. And we've traditionally used beta blockers in, in patients with angina and patients with coronary artery disease because they reduce the workload of the heart. They reduce the heart rate and they reduce the oxygen consumption of the heart, which means that for any given amount of work, uh, then the heart uses less oxygen. This is what happens with physical fitness, not to go on again about exercise, but heart, athletes have lower heart rates and that's because the heart is more efficient at that with, with a larger volume per beat and a lower heart rate. And so beta blockers try and mimic that. Um, so we still use them. There are slightly newer ones that, uh, that uh, are, are on the market now that try to help with dilating the arteries. But not a lot has really changed. There isn't, the answer is really there isn't a lot new. One of the things that has changed though is we've moved away a little bit from using beta blockers uh, for high blood pressure. It used to be that they were really some of the first line agents that we'd use for high blood pressure. And we've, uh, you notice on my blood pressure slide, I, I didn't mention them and I didn't mention them because they've really moved pretty far down the list. We tend to go to these ACE inhibitors or these diuretics or these calcium channel blockers first. There are various genetic uh, mutations that run in families that can cause very specific abnormalities in your cholesterol. And uh, low HDL, of course, as we've mentioned, that's the good cholesterol. Having low levels, it would potentially be a bad thing. And, uh, and there's actually some, uh, there's some very clear mutations that have been defined in, uh, in some enzymes that help that do cholesterol uh, biosynthesis um, that, that dictate that and that, that are quite well recognized. And so actually here at Stanford we have a clinic and we're talking about formalizing it even more, uh, basically bringing together all the cardiovascular genetic tests, so all the familial uh, uh, syndromes in cardiovascular. That includes the one that I spend quite a lot of my time thinking about, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also includes all the familial hyperlipidemias uh, of which the low HDL uh, there's a very rare form, Tangier's disease, and uh, there are many other forms. They're little, small, extra arteries that are basically, well, there's some debate about whether some of them are formed, but just not really used, little channels uh, of arteries that are there that can open up 
or whether they're actually made new in the adult. And, and, they're, and they come about especially if an artery is chronically blocked. So our Mrs. B patient who had a blockage in the artery chronically, she probably started to grow little extra arteries around. And we have some patients who end up growing their own bypass tracts. We didn't talk at all really about bypass grafting today, the surgical approach to this, but sometimes we have patients who would otherwise need bypass grafts, but they have sort of grown their own blood vessels around a blockage, and therefore they manage to supply blood to that region without needing the main artery, because they do it through lots of small tributaries. So that seems like a, a nice place to stop, and I'd, I'd like to just thank, uh, and, if, and if you would too, thank Stuart for coming along and sharing his story with you. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.